I want to say thank you for being here. My name is Michelle Trupiano. I'm the director of the Missouri Medicaid Coalition. And as you know, um, 300,000 Missouri lives are hanging in the balance, and they are desperate for the Missouri legislature to act. We are here today, and we have been spending the day trying to focus on those 300,000 folks. So many times the legislature gets caught up in policy and in numbers um, that they forget the lives that are on the line. They forget the faces of the people that we are here for. So today is about sharing those stories. And so in a few minutes, um, you're going to hear from several people who fall into the coverage gap um, and that they are here not only on behalf of themselves, but on behalf of, like I said, the 300,000 Missourians that are also in the coverage gap that are desperate for the Missouri legislature to take action. So I'm going to start with Daisy um, from Kansas City, who's going to share a bit of her story. Welcome, Daisy. Hi, Daisy. My name is Daisy Rimmers. I'm a college student. I work part-time. I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at the age of 16. Uh, I then moved to Missouri in 2009. Uh, so my dad lost his insurance in around when I moved here in 2009. So since 2000, 2009, I had no health care uh, insurance or anything. Um, I was uh, referred to SWOL. I was taken to SWOL health care. And they referred me to Truman Medical Center. And then it took me about a year and a half to get in, just to get to see a specialist. And I was di I was also diagnosed with lupus and hypothyroidism. Um, if without and have a have a um, trouble like uh, um, paying for my own medications because medication can be so <laughs> expensive and paying and I basically have to save up my money to pay my own medication because the medication is so expensive and I can't afford it. And, and why are you here today? I am here because um, to, to I want this to pass. I want this med um, Medicaid expansion to pass and because I suffer a lot with this, with not having any health insurance. I think everybody needs health care services. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Next, we're going to hear from Beverly from St. Louis. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Beverly Jones, and like she said, I am from North St. Louis. Uh, I was diagnosed with lupus in 2004. Uh, at the time that I was diagnosed, I was working full-time, going to school full-time, and taking care of five daughters. Mm -hmm. I have five daughters and 17 grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, you know, being hit with such a announcement like, you have lupus, we do not know how to solve your problem. It throws you into a depression, okay? Um, if it had not been for the ladies that were that I worked for at uh, the Grace Hill Agency, I probably would have stayed in the bed in the dark, not wanting to get up, thinking that my life was over. Uh, but because I did have those type of people in my life, uh, I got up. I decided that I was going to go to work and I was going to make the best out of every opportunity that I had. Um, with that diagnosis, later on came the fibromyalgia, the COPD, and I also have osteoarthritis. In the last, in the past two years, year and a half, I have had five surgeries. Now, mind you, I do not have any health care, okay? But the doctors did perform the surgeries. I did stay at the hospital, and somebody has to pay for that. You know, uh, when we talk about expanding Medicaid, not just for myself, but for everybody else in Missouri that needs it, it's either you make $10 too much mm. or you're not sick enough mm. for them to give it to you. Yeah. But you still have to go to the doctor. You still have to pay for medications. You still need to get to the doctor. Okay, see, a lot, a lot of times people don't think about all the things that go into a doctor's appointment. 
until you don't have it. At this point, I am on the verge, maybe one step from filing bankruptcy, because in 2006, I got so sick that I lost my job because I was not released by my doctor to return to work, catch 22, well, if you don't come back this day, then you no longer have a job. So I no longer had a job. With being ill, I have lost my home. I've lost my car. Uh, not have enough money to feed my family. Um, I'm turning things around because now I am working part time on the weekends, uh, and I got I, I was able to do that because my doctor said it was okay for me to do that. But just think about all of the other people that do not have the opportunities that I have or the educational background that I have. Because I can sit at a desk and I can just do what I need to do from the desk. Uh, but what about the people that don't have the education that I have? So a lot of times when I go out in the communities and talk about this, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about them. Because we need to help each other. Okay? And the numbers from how much it's costing for us to go to the hospital versus what the state says they're going to have to pay, I really don't see a difference, okay? So that's why I'm here to help them pass the Medicaid. Okay, the next is Jennifer Ariel from Joplin. Hello, my name is Ariel, like she said, I'm from Joplin. And first I would just like to thank every single one of you that's here. Thank you so much for your support. It means so much to know that people care. Um, so um, up until 2011, I had a full-time job which had medical benefits. I was able to work, take care of my two children, one of which who has severe disabilities and autism. Um, after the tornado, we lost everything, including my ability to work. Um, so I found myself relocating to Oklahoma where I was able to get state Medicaid, which is wonderful. I could go to the doctor for my migraines and my arthritis and the PTSD that I acquired from the tornado. Um, and then in 2012, I moved back to Joplin to be near family, and I was really distraught to learn that I didn't qualify for Medicaid in the state of Missouri, even though I had only moved about three hours away from where I was in Oklahoma. So I now find myself still a full-time <coughs> university student, still working, uh, still taking care of my two wonderful children, but now I live in constant fear that if I was to break the bone, if I was to need a surgery, um, that that would be it, you know, and I hear uh, legislation and senators saying, well, it's going to cost so much money and it's going to come from here and it's going to come from there. Well, if I'm not there to take care of my children, where do you think that that money is going to come from to take care of my children? It's going to come from the state. So if you can just give me the preventative care now I need to be able to remain in my home, I can take care of my children Amen. myself. Yeah. Thank you. And next we're going to hear from two parents who never want to be in the position that they're in where they're trying to advocate for their children um, because they don't get the services that they need. So John and Beth. How long can I stay? <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is John and my daughter's name is Danielle. My wife and I are parents of five children, ten grandchildren. My daughter is the only one that has no insurance of any kind. Uh, she lives in Jackson, Missouri. She's a social worker in Perry County in Perryville. She is the director of New Life Missouri. Uh, she's currently working on her master's degree. She has seven children. Uh, seven of my ten grandchildren are from her, as you can see. Four biological, three special needs adopted children who have Medicaid. Her and her husband have no insurance. Uh, they don't make enough money to get a subsidy on the Affordable Care Act. Their employers provide no health insurance of any kind. So my story is kind of like your story, but I'm advocating. What's going to happen when my daughter gets sick and can't provide for these children? Uh, I'm here, like all of you are, trying to get these senators, these representatives, to get on board with some type of a program. And if they don't do so soon, we're just in a, a world of trouble here in Missouri, I think. I've heard every excuse today that we can come up with. I've heard every lie. And I think we just need to continually be uh, pushing these folks to do something for the good of people. Not just for my daughter, for my neighbors in Peebley, and for all of you that have the same type of story. So thank you for listening to me.
My name is Beverly Cowling, and I'm actually here from O'Fallon, St. Charles County, on behalf of my daughter, who is Shannon Johnson. Shannon is now 37, but for 19 years she has suffered from reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is also known as the chronic regional pain syndrome. It is the most painful medical condition known to the medical community, and there's nothing that can fix it. And because she was diagnosed, or unable to be diagnosed for 19 years, it has progressed to late stage 3, and it can never get better. My daughter walks with a very pronounced gait. Her left leg is thrown at an angle. She is, her leg has atrophied. She is in so much pain most of the time that she cannot function. She has tried to work. She cannot hold a job, and she's repeatedly turned down for disability. Had she had Medicaid, when she was 18 and first presented symptoms, she would never have progressed beyond stage one. She would be working. She would have health care through an employer. And worse than that, she has never and will never be able to realize her dream, which is to have a no-kill animal shelter. My daughter is a loving and compassionate and wonderful person. And by not expanding Medicaid, we are telling people in Missouri that their lives don't matter. Mm -hmm. Well, my daughter matters. My daughter has value. And now she is living in so much pain. The only possible treatment for her now is implantation into her spine of a neurostimulator, which she will have to then operate from a remote control that will convert the pain to a very strong tingling sensation. That has a 50-50 chance of working. And even then, most people who have that strong tingling cannot stand it because it's just so disruptive to your way of life. Often when my daughter gets out of bed in the morning, if she can even sleep because the nerves go crazy in her body, and every 15 minutes she has to change positions. But when sometimes in the morning when she gets up, she cannot even walk. She literally crawls from her bed to her kitchen. And it, it is the most debilitating thing and I'm here to say there's no amount of hard work that she could have done to have made her life better. The situation she is in now, that was not her choice. I keep hearing about people making a choice to live the lives they're living. This was not her choice. People who have access to health care are productive and happy people. They work, and when they can work, they boost our economy. And there is something so wrong when we talk about the cost of expanding Medicaid without considering the fact that so many people like Shannon will not be drawing food stamps that will reduce the outlay in our state. And we're, the financial windfall that we could actually have by expanding Medicaid far outweighs any other economic concern. Thank you. We should never, ever in this state allow another neglected person like Shannon Johnson. Finally, we're going to hear from Reverend Jim Bryan. Uh, thank each and every one of you for being here and doing what you do to make uh, to make to try to make this a better world and a better state. Uh, I'm aware of a number of different organizations that are here, and I know I'm going to miss some. And I don't mean that. I just mean to say this: the people in this room represent so many different organizations, like MCU in St. Louis, like CCO in Kansas City, like the Real Crisis Center, like NAMI, like Missouri Faith Voices, like More Square, like SEIU, like Jobs with Justice, uh, like M I can't read my writing, like em Empower, <laughs> Empower Missouri, and Missouri Healthcare for All. All of these are organizations that have come together with, with Medicaid coalition to say we have a moral responsibility in this state to do the right thing. That's right. When, I was, when I was a child, a tiny little child, my mother and father taught me the golden rule. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, yes. The golden rule. Well, I grew up and found out that there's a nice version of that in, in Romans, in, uh, in, the, in the Christian scriptures. In the Hebrew scriptures, we talk about loving your neighbor as yourself. From, from the beginning, all the way through seminary, and all the way through 35 years of ministry, I've been trying to say, now what's right? 
and what's wrong. You know, on the right side, we have compassion, we have mercy, we have caring for others, we have helping for others. On the wrong side, we have not helping others, hurting people. Let's do what's right. Doing what's right is not always easy. It's not always the least expensive. Right. But where is the excuse? I, I heard one person today who I know is going to vote against any possibility of expansion to, to say, I know the stories. It really pulls on your heartstrings. Well, it doesn't pull enough for them to change their vote right. and to work hard to get medical coverage for the least and the last of our friends and our neighbors. It is time that we, as the people of Missouri, representing so many places, so many walks of life, so many different communities of faith, to say to our representatives, this is the right thing to do and we won't stand for less. Right. We need to. So with that, I just want to say on behalf of the Medicaid Coalition and to thank all of you for being here today that um, we do know what's right. And we're going to continue to be down here day after day, week after week, talking to every legislator, um, convincing them to do what's right, because they know what is right also. Um, and no amount of misfacts and misinformation um, is going to stand in our way of continuing to advocate for all of you here, but for all the 300,000 people in Missouri um, who are desperate for Medicaid expansion. So with that, I want to thank our speakers. They will be available for individual interviews um, afterwards if any of the press want to talk with them. Um, and thank all of you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.